I once wrote a fun article for Boing Boing magazine. And I forget what it's called, but if you Google like Eisler, Boing Boing, and Martian, you'll find the article. And one of the things I talk, so, so I'm trying to explain and justify in this article, American violence to a Martian who thinks, who just comes down to earth and looks around. And he's like, well, you Americans are really violent people. And I'm like, no, not really. I mean, our violence is super justified. And the Martian doesn't understand what I'm, everything I'm trying to explain. And at one point, and, and I keep getting stuck because the Martian's making so much sense. And I say, for example, okay, okay, <clears throat> now here's the difference. Like ISIS, they're barbarians. They burn people alive. Did you know that? It's true. ISIS burns people alive. And the Martian says, but did you not Americans yourself, yourselves invent the weapon called napalm, which you used in Vietnam? And napalm stands for sodium palmitrate, jellied gasoline. Does, does this substance not adhere to the flesh of human beings and incinerate them? When it does that, and I'm like, oh, okay, okay, but that was a long time ago. And the Martian says, but don't you Americans have a missile that you call, <clears throat> that, that is called, it's a thermobaric missile, thermobaric being Greek for thermo heat, baric pressure. Thermobaric means it creates a huge pressurized blast wave of tremendous heat that incinerates people. And do you not celebrate this effect in the very name you've given the missile, the Hellfire missile? And I'm like, ah. Oh. All right, I'll get off the fire topic. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so it's interesting, these things that like, if you try to look at them with foreign eyes, they can look quite strange. Like if North Korea carved the images of previous leaders like Kim Jong-il, and I can't remember his father's name, your grandfather. Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong -il. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I forget at this point, but with yeah. all the Kims. And if they carved the their likenesses on a mountain, for example, we'd be like, oh my God, can you believe like the worship of political I, leaders? That's, that's one thing, Barry, I think that I've agreed with everything you said, but until that one, I mean, people coming into North Korea, having to bow to the statue of Kim, Kim Il-sung or being thrown in jail, there's definitely leader worship in North Korea, yeah, but yeah. there's, you're right. I mean, you know, there, there are things that we need to be looked at from in our own country through the, the, the eyes of people who are not, who are not, American. And sure. that's my big argument mm. for living and working abroad at least once in your life. It's right? so eye-opening. It and is. To go back to go back to Japan for one second. When I first lived in Japan and I had a much more blinkered um <clears throat> American view about how like America's the greatest <laughs> America's the greatest nation in the history of the world, TM. And lots of people said this. Marco Rubio tweeted it out. Like, that's a quote. That's verbatim. Marco, Marco Rubio, America, greatest nation. And you'll find the tweets. But it's not just one side or the other. Like, this, you have to say this stuff. As a U.S. politician, Barack Obama said it. I wrote a blog post about it at the time. He said that America is the envy of the world. And every other country wants to be America. This is deeply neurotic stuff. It, it just, it really is. But... You have to be, say it, I guess, if you're a U.S. politician. It's really weird. I'm not saying everything is the same, by the way. Like, we, we, don't, we haven't reached a point yet where you have to bow to U.S. politicians, but, and we don't have les majeste laws, but what I always find useful as an exercise, and it's a hard exercise, is to do this. What do I do that's like that? What does my country or my in-group do that's like that? Not, it doesn't have to be nearly as bad or as extreme or widespread or anything, but do I, do we do anything like that? So, and I would say we do actually. Um, uh, it's like a larger topic, but it's very interesting to me to see um, some of the controversy about whether Jill Biden should be called Dr. Jill Biden. Yeah, that's been brought up yeah. the news quite a bit lately. Yeah, she's 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 she has a doctorate. She can be called doctor. She could ask to be called doctor. But it's just interesting to me the way that um, <clears throat> the selective outrage. By the way, I I took a quick look at the, the op ed and the guy who wrote that op ed. He sounds like a total meathead to me. I mean, embarrassingly thought. I usually don't try to take sides, but I I agree. I, I thought just, it was it was it awful. just sounded yeah. the kindest thing you could say. But he's been writing like this for his whole life, apparently. But you could say like he's reached an age where he should stop writing. I think that would be the kindest thing to say. But but it's been interesting for me to see the um the way we feel like nay, if uh, the way we should give deference, the way we should defer to powerful people. I don't think that's healthy. Uh, here's the thing we do in America that to me is bizarre. People keep 
titles. Hillary Clinton is still Madam Secretary, and Joe Biden insisted on being called Vice President Biden for uh, for eight or for rather four years. Or previous presidents, they're still president. Same whatever thing. they get to be President called Carter. President. Yeah, Secret if you're Secretary of State, you're still you're still Mister. So all this kind of stuff. Yeah, keep it. Governors, same thing. Mike Huckabee's Twitter handles Governor Huckabee. I'm not. Since this is a nonpartisan thing. It's deeply weird to me. I don't think we should, and it, it's this excessive veneration of powerful people. We should be doing the absolute, uh, the absolute opposite. We shouldn't venerate people. We should hold them in deep suspicion. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows the expression power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We know that, but we don't apply it. Then we're like, excuse me while I venerate you, Mr. President, who hasn't been president in 20 years, et cetera, or Madam Secretary or Governor this. So do we bow to these people like they're forced to bow to a statue in North Korea? I, not that I'm aware of. And I don't know that much about North Korea, but I'm always more interested instead of going, oh my God, those primitive North Koreans or oh my God, those propagandized North Koreans. I always find it more valuable to say, huh, like, yeah, I don't like that. I think that's crazy. Do we do anything like that? What is it? That's, that's a good point. And that's it's a good valuable. point, Barry. Yeah, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anything is the same uh, qualitatively, quantitatively, but it's a useful <clears throat> exercise. So, um, so back, back to Japan, one of the things, when I went over there, I, there were two things I saw that I really looked down on as the smart American I was coming from the more enlightened culture and like, my God, don't these people know? One of them was um, there were no big box stores. So it's less convenient. You know, you got to go to four different stores to- Don Quixote is in big box. <laughs> so, you know, Don Quixote wasn't around back then. At least I didn't know of it if it was. This is 1993. Uh, uh, it's saved my life I, a few times though. Don Quixote, Don Quixote trying to find really anti-purse convenient. print in Japan. Don Quixote. <laughs> <laughs> or Amazon now, I guess. So, but this is the thing. And there's a larger point here. I started to realize we lived in Sengoku, as I mentioned. It's really small part of town of Tokyo. It feels like a small town in the middle of this megalopolis. And on the way back from the Kodokan in the evening, I would typically have to stop at at least one and sometimes a couple of different mom and pop shops for whatever reason to pick up the dry cleaning. Oh, we need some dish soap. That'd be one, you know, a different store. You have to go to this convenience, go to that convenience, or go to this store. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We'll pick up some fruit or whatever. That would be the fruit stand. And everyone would, um, when you get home, they greet you. Um, what is it? Oh my God, it's I'm so rusty. Now. Oka, okaidi nasai. Is okaidi nasai. Yeah. Tadaima yeah. okaidi nasai. They'd recognize me. I'm not hard to recognize in Sengoku. And they'd be like, okaidi nasai. Oh my God, like welcome home to our little corner of Tokyo in the evening as you buy my, like a couple of apples or whatever. Ringo, yeah. whatever. And it was so lovely. And then I started to read about and, and enjoy all the fruits of low crime rates in Japan. It's an incredible, Tokyo is an incredibly safe city relative to American cities, certainly. And I don't know, I'm not a sociologist, but how is it that Tokyo is so safe? Well, I know that anonymity breeds uh, deviancy. This is just, everybody knows. I saw it in Japan with like trips, business trips to Bangkok and these guys who, were, who behave so properly, Japanese executives who behave so properly in home in Japan behave terribly overseas because nobody knows them and they can do whatever. They, and there are other factors too, but, but anonymity is one of them. Put on a mask, become part of a crowd, and uh, it's freeing in a way that's not always um, socially desirable. So I'm like, well, maybe this has something to do with why there's so little crime, which is extremely freeing in a lot of different ways. Women walk home alone from the subway stop at midnight. It's incredible. So how do little they do kids that? too? They go, they, go, they go to kindergarten of by course. themselves. Oh my God. Yeah. Like yeah. Little children on the train. It's incredible. So <laughs> does the fact that everybody knows everyone else, like you can't just go to an anonymous checkout line in a gigantic store and never see the same clerk twice it's these people who own the store and live over it well i mean so and even they, if and even if there's not that personal like they really don't know you just that right. interaction irashaimase, when you come in exactly. like well welcome to the store totally that is a humanizing thing right exactly. so that you're 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 beat you're you're run down after you're you know you've done some some overwork over time <laughs> in japan like right. a lot of people do and you're yeah. just like, I just need to get myself something I can zap in the microwave, which they'll do for you, by the way. And you yeah. <laughs> go up there and the guy's just like, you know, and, but at least you hear the irashaimase, right? Exactly. And you're like, all right, somebody wants to, <laughs> to see me <laughs> or whatever. Right. Yeah. It's lovely. And yeah. so, and this is what I think is important. You don't have to take a position on which system is better. These benefits are greater. Those costs are better or greater, but it's just 
I want to live my life in a way that I appreciate the costs and benefits of the various alternatives. So in Japan, you have this lovely experience of community that at least at the time was caused by the absence, I think was caused by the absence of big box stores and the fact that all the shops were mom and pop shops, literally like they would live over the store or behind it. And you get to know them a little bit. The other one that was an eye opener for me was the gas stands, the gas stations where um, prices are, there's a floor set on prices. So the, the gas stands can't compete on price. It's elite, like they, the price is kept artificially high. You can't charge below. So everybody charges the same artificially With high price. So they have to compete on service. And what is, and, and, and for Americans, everybody who's lived in Japan has experienced this. It's funny. I um, in a lovely way, like, a car pulls in and there's one kid they're all teenagers and he's like guiding the car in what i what i what i what i what i yeah so, so, so. and then and then like and then like five kids rush out one's got the gas in there the other's checking the oil they clean your windows they check the tire pressure it's like something you see at a racetrack and then when you go back to the street somebody like they, they hold off the track in, and they're like okay and they get you back yep. on the street and, and they bow usually at too at the end they'll all, like take off and they'll bow to you as you leave. that's right yeah that's right yeah. thanking you for your patronage. So, at, and at first I looked at this and I'm like, oh my God, you know, so stupid. Don't they know that um, if you, if you like, let, if you let them pump their own gas, yeah, and then you can, then, you can then cut down your overhead lower, and yeah. you'll have lower prices. You will. And lower prices for consumers, that's a good thing. In, independent of anything else, I think most people would agree, yeah, lower prices for consumers is a good thing. It's a benefit. But what they do is they wind up employing a lot of teenagers who would otherwise be unemployed, work at the yep. gas stands because they have it's to trade on service. And that's a good thing too. More yep. widespread employment prevents delinquency. Maybe they're not just hanging out, like looking for trouble. Who knows? So there are benefits to the Japanese way too. You don't even have to take a position on I which is better saying but just recognize there's a reason that there's a benefit to doing it that way. And then you can have, instead of this condescending narcissistic attitude that binds you to everything um, outside your own experience, you can have a much more productive like, diplomatic attitude. I see why you do it that way. That's interesting. I can see what you're getting. We do it this way for the following reason, huh? And maybe you can start to take the best of various systems and craft something that's uniquely suited for your own culture. Like I but think these, are, this is what you get from living in another, it's, a, it's what I got anyway, among other things. That's the key. It's more than a business trip. You go and live there. If you can. If you yeah. can. Not that there's yeah, a, but, a business trip is nice, but. But, I, but even if it's like a short-term assignment and you go day to day yeah, and you get integrated into the culture, even if it's just a little bit, right? Yeah. Which is why I really tell, you know, as many people as I can, especially our students at NC State University, get out there. I mean, right now it's not yeah. safe. You know, but we're, we'll get through this and it, we'll come to a point where we can go out into the, the world For again. Sure. Get out there. Take any chance you have yeah. and go. You're young. Go out there and have that experience. It, no matter yeah. where you go, it's going to benefit you. And totally all of those things. Well, I would very much like to, at some point after, you know, you're in another break in your writing at some point after you finished your, your current manuscript or whatever, I'd love to have a part two. To this, to this, we totally interview. enjoy that. I know we're um, just warming up. Yeah, no, I, I, I <laughs> thank you so much for for all for making time for us and all of this. I would like to um, direct people who are watching this to the best resources that that to to know about you, to be able to access your works. So we know of you know BarryEisler.com, um, which sure. is a fantastic website, and you can there's so much stuff there. It's it's really great. Uh, oh, you can you even know, see the spelling right behind me that's right <laughs> my, wife, of my wife and daughter had this framed and when i do a zoom call i tape it over the window because otherwise the light, oh very nice it fits perfectly now is that the graphic <laughs> novel that's that was yes tying? it's not exactly a graphic novel it's it's got animation inside it this is my john rain prequel graveyard of memories that's set in um <clears throat> in tokyo in 1972 when rain is i don't know 20 years old where and can they where can people get see that i want to i want to watch it Oh, um, Amazon, the Kindle store, okay. go to my website and, oh my God, the, whatever, I mean, but the art they did is, is so beautiful. Like I didn't uh, realize it. I don't have these sorts of images in my head when I'm writing. So it's very strange for me when the artist produced this, I was like, oh, that's, yes, that's exactly what it feels like. Uh, so yeah, man. I love that. I love that live animated version of the Kindle book. It's very cool. Anyway. Awesome. So yeah, thanks. Uh, my website's a good place to find out more, follow me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. 
Um, thanks, Jonathan, for having uh, for having me um, <laughs> as the guest. It's it's been a pleasure talking to you. No, and thank you so much. And I this I promised you this, and I'm putting this in now. It's also a shameless plug for us. That, that's <laughs> the, that's the the front of the T-shirt for the Japan Center, and then this is Sugoi. the back. It's the 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 helmet. That's awesome. So this is actually the helmet of the suit of samurai armor that we have at at the Japan Center. That's um, really cool. And I just put it through a few filters so it looks cool and stylistic. But that's the <laughs> nail. So thank you I so can't much. Wait. Thank you. For, uh, for making time for us, I promise. Um, you know, according to uh, Barry's schedule, and you know, and um, <laughs> I get wanting to talk time. to me again, well, we will do a part two. And um, I would enjoy that. Saiko no yorikobi deshita. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for making time. And um, please stay safe, you and your family. And you too. Stay healthy. So thanks again. Thank you, Jonathan. I'll talk to you again. Cheers.